Hey, Richmond. It's good to see you. Um, I think we are facing a crisis of conformity, a crisis of standardization that we see all around us, and I don't like it. I think that we need to find more places to celebrate and encourage imagination, and the Institute for Contemporary Art is going to be one of those places. I was reminded a few weeks ago, when I had to go to my first elementary science fair, <laughs> that places that are sometimes thought of as spots for experimentation and learning new things can also be sites for conformity. I walked into the science fair, <laughs> and I was overwhelmed by the amount of information initially. And then I started realizing the display boards were prominent, um, all from Staples and Office Max. Everything was presented in exactly the same way. And then I quickly realized that even the science experiments were repeated. Initially, I thought, how does everybody know that they should turn a lemon into a battery? <laughs> and soon, I admit, I started getting bored. And I started realizing that all of these projects were coming off of the internet, and kids were, kids were copying what they had seen when they Googled different possibilities for science fairs. And so I started doing my own experiment in the science fair, <laughs> much to my husband's dismay. And I started realizing that there were a lot of people wearing North Face jackets. <laughs> And so I, I started taking little photos with my iPhone every time I saw one, and it became a little challenge to see how many different types of people in different ages I could, I could represent. My husband is the only one pictured without a North Face jacket up there. Um, he pointed that out to me. I call this the North Face effect. <laughs> I know, I saw many of you out in the lobby. You know who you are. The North Face effect in the 21st century is much like it was in the 20th century when I was growing up in the 1970s. And you might as well have called it the Nike effect or the Levi's effect. We all know as, as kids, as teenagers, as adults, there's this imperative to, to conform, to make sure that we fit in. And it comes, it comes from a very basic human desire um, that I think is tied to, to fear of being different. But increasingly in our lives, we are faced with standardization. Not to say that it's always bad, but I think that there is an excess of standardization that's happening everywhere, not just in big box stores and in businesses. It's happening in universities, it's happening in elementary schools, it's happening really everywhere that we look. In every generation, in every, in every century, there have been people who have risen up to fight conformity whether it was Socrates, or Einstein, or Jesus, or Galileo, there were always people who were fighting against the standards of the time and trying to open up imagination and allow it to be something that was free and could operate without risk of failure. It reminds me of Fight Club, my favorite movie of all time. Uh, one, of the, one of the most important scenes, Edward Norton is sitting on the toilet looking at an Ikea catalog like a porn magazine. And essentially, it is, it's the, a very important moment in the movie because it shows us um, this crisis of conformity. And if you've seen Fight Club, you know what happens um, because he's been, he's been sort of forced into these particular roles in society and there's a psychic break that occurs. I won't ruin it. Art has always been a place where the imagination has been allowed to roam free. It's a place, it's really a free zone for, for creativity and for experimentation. It's the purest form of innovation that we can have in our society. Merritt Oppenheim knew that in 1936 when she created her important fur-lined teacup, one of the first surrealist objects that ever came into our world. Imagine holding it in your hands, putting it up to your lips. The displacement, the unexpected juxtaposition, the way that the the, the world of dreams and the unconscious could surface into the everyday world and help to transform our lives and the way that we experience it. 
It happened again in the 60s and in the 70s and beyond with people and sculptors like Klaus Oldenburg, who created this large-scale project at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis with the large spoon and cherry that became a pedestrian walkway and bridge. These things from our everyday life that lodge themselves in our unconscious and then somehow reappear in the public sphere to help make it a more magical, a more wonderful, a more marvelous world to live in. I had the opportunity to take these lessons and put them to work when I lived in Indianapolis and worked on the first 100-acre sculpture park that focused on all commissioned site-responsive works by artists from around the world. In the 100-acre park, we created a full-size international basketball court that became a surrealist intervention and that allowed people to engage with it and to have joy in their lives from a place that could have only been imagined in dreams previously. It happened with benches that were interventions around a 35-acre lake, and instead of just taking something off the rack or buying it from a catalog, we had an artist yet behind imagine how to create benches that could be interactive and playful. I did it again at the U.S. Pavilion in Venice when I was U.S. Commissioner um, for the Venice Biennale, which is the Olympics of the art world, and I had the pleasure of representing the United States. Here, Alora and Calzadilla, an artist duo, presented an overturned tank with a treadmill. We figured out how to make it work, not an easy task. Making the impossible possible is one of the things that I like to do. We also brought in the U.S. Olympic team, and we worked with athletes in order to help further the theme of international competition in business, in science, in, um, and also in the art world. And this is Dan O'Brien, a gold medalist. Inside the pavilion, people had the opportunity to interact with a handmade organ from Bonn, Germany, and that was attached to a working functional ATM. When you put your card in, it would play randomized notes like, uh, that were composed by an avant-garde musician in Brooklyn. And so there were different avant-garde sounds uh, waffling through the air uh, throughout the, the Giardini in Venice. It brings me back to Richmond and thinking about what brought me here in the first place, the possibility for creative transformation, which is already happening all around us every day, and this audience only reaffirms my belief that it's going to be a powerful and ongoing trend in this city to be a capital of creativity and not just the Confederacy. We have Confederate reenactors on um, the screen on the top left, and we also have um, in the same day of experiences, my schizophrenic life as a director of a, of a growing nonprofit art institution. Um, also, a, a, a visit to Guar, um, the heavy metal thrash band, which was born out of the counterculture here in Richmond. And this is a city that contains opposites, many, many paradoxical opposites that come together and coexist. It's not just a conservative place and a progressive place, a rich place, a poor place, a white place, a black place, an old place a new place, a north place, a south place. It's all of these things, and it can be maddening and confusing and kaleidoscopic. But we have to embrace it, because that's what makes this city unique, and it, it's what gives us an opportunity to create and to celebrate the imagination. Jefferson did it. Monticello, back in the day, was a contemporary architectural structure. We think of it now, and it's found its way into the past, into history. It's been historicized, especially when we look at it in relationship to something like Stephen Hull's new Institute for Contemporary Art, which is going to be just a few blocks from here. We'll break ground in a few months. I can't wait for this thing to start growing and becoming in the city of Richmond and in the United States and in the world, because this is going to be a place where we can celebrate complexity and paradox and have conversations that engage everyone in the community and beyond. It's going to be a place that might just disrupt some of these science fair um, 
this was one project that really captivated me. You can tell why. It was an art bot. It was built out of Legos and Crayola markers. And I looked at those two boys in the pictures, and I was rooting them on. I was so proud of them. I said to my husband, come over here. Look at this project. Look how creative it is. It's an automatic drawing machine. So many artists in the world have experimented with drawing machines. This is so cool. And I left self-satisfied that art had saved the day and was the most creative thing in, in the art fair. But then when I was preparing my TED talk, I thought, <laughs> I thought that it would be important to just double check and make sure that this was not also like all the other science projects, something that you could Google and it would tell you how to do it. Lo and behold, it was. I still liked it the best. <laughs> so I want to leave you with one thought, a thought by the founder of Surrealism, Andre Breton. We have two choices. We can give in to that. It's never going to go away. We can't fight it. We can't beat it. There's convenience in it, whatever. But it's not going to be the thing that lifts our hearts and our souls and our imagination and makes life matter and makes it feel like it's worth living, like there's some kind of thing that is greater than the sum of, the sum of our day-to-day -day necessary parts. And so I leave you with this quote. Dear imagination, what I love most about you is your unforgiving nature. To make a slave of the imagination is to fail profoundly, to do justice to one's deepest self. Only imagination realizes the possible in me, and it is enough to lift for a moment the dreadful proscription. Thank you.